Hey, it's great to have you here this morning uh, for our service at Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. We're about to go on a journey this morning in pursuit of God's leading in our life. So um, buckle your seatbelts and get ready for a ride. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it would guide us and direct us. I pray that it would be responsive to what you have to say this morning. These things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. His dad quote, son, are you working hard or are you hardly working? Well, it's that, kind of, it's that kind of thinking that we come to when we're talking about how to live the Christian life. And Jesus gives us a promise about whether we're just putting in our time or whether we're living the Christian life. If we're really trying to be a Jesus follower and not just in name only, but really trying to be a Jesus follower, Jesus gives this promise. He gave it, first of all, to his disciples, but also uh, by extension to us. He said in John 16, 33, I've told you this thing so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So right in the middle of that verse is a promise for us, and the promise is this. In this world, you will have trouble if you're a follower of me. Now, isn't that a promise you just want to embrace? Oh, great, I'm going to have trouble. That's fantastic. And most of us don't really, you know, really want to bring trouble upon ourselves, but Jesus said that's the promise. And it's a promise not just that we're going to have trouble, but we're going to have trouble if we're following him. We get enough, in enough trouble, guys, don't we, on our own? We don't, have to, we don't have to manufacture any. As a matter of fact, I mean, I, I'd like to take a vote now. Any wives, any wives here had your husband do something stupid and got himself in trouble? Well, would you look at that, guys? Unanimous opinion. We've all done something stupid and got ourselves in trouble. I mean, I'm the king of it, I will admit. There was a time I remember I walked into the house, my kids were little, my wife was there, and I picked up a, a, a flower vase. It had a little bit of water in it, I was thirsty. I drank it down out of the flower vase. My wife screams, Jay, that was bleach. Oh man, I just about ate my, it just about ate my throat out. Fortunately, I, it was diluted with some water, but you know, I can bring some trouble on myself without having to do much work. I don't have to look very far other than what I do. I remember one time I was out in the car and I was underneath the, uh, the steering panel. I was trying to glue something together with some super glue. And this, the stupid super glue wouldn't come out of the, of, the, of the container. So I said, well, the best thing to do is suck something out. So I put it in my mouth, sucked it a little bit. And all of a sudden, my lips were shut. They were glued together. I thought from then on I'd have to eat out of a tube. But fortunately, as you can see, I managed to solve that problem. But guys and ladies, we can bring trouble on ourselves. We don't have much trouble with that. But when Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble, he was talking about specifically if you are a true Jesus follower, if you pass the test, I'm a true follower of Jesus, you will have trouble. And that is our topic for today. We're going to be moving into the book of 1 Thessalonians. And Paul wrote the book of 1 Thessalonians to some new believers. As a matter of fact, he had, he had, he had visited uh, Thessalonica and stayed there for two to three weeks. That was it. And there were converts. And then he'd, he'd moved on. He ended up in Rome. But one of the very first, if not the very first writing of the New Testament was the book of, of the, uh, First Thessalonians. It was a letter that Paul wrote to the people at Thessalonica because he wanted to give them a, man, a training manual on how to be a true follower of Jesus. And so we're going to be moving into that book, First Thessalonians, over the next few weeks to talk about what are the basics of becoming a follower of Jesus. But before we do that, we need to set up the background a little bit. How did, how did, the, how did Paul get connected with these people of Thessalonica? And in order to do that, we have to look at the book of Acts because Acts the, the, the two stars of the book of Acts, early in Acts, is Peter, and later in Acts is Paul. And Paul, believe it or not, is a true follower. He knows what it means to be in trouble. So we're going to start by looking at Paul's experience as we talk about the t topic of trouble in the life of a believer. What can we learn from the Apostle Paul? I think the first thing we learn is be ready to obey the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul realized that he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And actually, uh, the church in Antioch, the elders got together and they prayed and they believed that Paul and Barnabas should be sent out from their church as missionaries. And Paul's philosophy was this, as well as the church there in Antioch, it was this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to ask for the leading of the Holy Spirit. But if I come up with an idea, if I come up with a thought that I should go here or do that, this, or, or in some way spread the gospel, because that was his purpose and that is our purpose, to contri contribute to spreading the gospel everywhere. 
And so he said, if I come up with an idea, I'm going to look to the Holy Spirit, but my, my initial answer is yes. I'm going to just say yes. And so here was Antioch. They, they, they sent out, the church in Antioch sent out uh, Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey, and they started out on their first missionary journey. They went from one town to another to another, and each town that they went, they, they shared the gospel. Paul had a, had, had a strategy. He would go to the synagogues first, and then he, would, then he would go to the Gentiles and share the gospel. And everywhere they went, people were coming to Christ. City after city, they would come to Christ, and the, a church would be formed. And so as the churches were formed, Paul came back and he would appoint elders so that these churches would begin to grow. And after his short first missionary journey, uh, he, he was pleased with the success and decided, you know, I'm going to go out on a second missionary journey, except for one minor problem. At, toward the end of that first missionary journey, he, he ran into a little bit of a uh, trouble in one town. It was, and we find the, uh, what happened in Acts chapter 14. And here's what it said. But the multitude of the city was divided. Part of them said that the Jews were sided with the Jews because the Jews didn't believe uh, Christ was the Messiah. And part of them sided with the apostles, that's Paul and Barnabas. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jew, Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to a surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. So on this missionary journey, there he was in this particular town, and all of a sudden a violent uh, riot broke out, and people were cut out to stone him, and he was able to escape from his life. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I might say, you know what? The Holy Spirit is kind of not leading me to go keep on doing this. It seems like maybe the door is closed and I should do something else. But remember, remember, Jesus gave us a promise that we can hold on to in this life, you will have trouble. And so Paul wasn't going to say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore because he said, you know, what I'm going to do is depend on the Holy Spirit. My job is to reach the Gentiles, reach the Gentile world with the gospel. And so even though I'm having trouble, and if it was me, I'd probably be saying, I think this is God's leading not to do anything else here. Paul said, I'm just going to say yes, as long as the Holy Spirit keeps leading. It was the town of Iconium. So what did Paul do? He said, okay, I'm leaving this town. He headed over for Derby. And when he got there, the people from, from his sending church, some people from that town of Antioch, as well as from Iconium he just came from, came to Derby and they stirred up the people there. Listen to what it says happened. The Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city and the next day departed with Bartimaeus and Derby. And when he had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. What did he do? He goes to the next town instead of saying, okay, I learned my lesson. He said, no, God, if, you, if, you, if you're calling me to do something, if you open the door, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to just say yes. So he went to Derby, and what happens there? The people from, from the previous towns came, and they stoned him. He was dead. They threw him out with, with the trash outside of town. But the disciples gathered around him, and he got up, and what did he do? He said, you know what? My job is to preach the gospel. I'm just going to say yes, because we already were promised by Jesus that tribulations were the way and troubles were the way we're going to enter the kingdom. Troubles will follow you if you are a true follower of Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, just say yes. And so Paul and Barnabas were going from city to city to city, and everywhere they went, there were new converts that were coming to Christ, and little churches were formed, and, and, and Paul was fulfilling the Great Commission. He was going from one city to the next to the next, seeing people come to Christ, and churches were formed. And, and at the same time, every place he went, fires were started. People, opposition was raised up. He, he was, there was a fire. He left a trail. He left of opposition wherever he went. There's a reason why Paul keeps saying that we are in a battle, right? That there's a, there's a prince and power of the air that does not want the gospel to spread, that does not want us to follow God, that does not want us to be soldiers, right? But his, he talks about how we need to take on the weapons of, of warfare, uh, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the the 
the uh, shoes of the gospel, all of these things, because we're in a battle. Paul recognized that. And so not only did Paul say yes whenever he was led by the Spirit, but the second thing, realizing there's going to be trouble, Paul always said, what's next? What's next? Look at, uh, look at um, Acts chapter 14, verse 6. It says, now, when they had gone to Perga and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. And as a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul was one stubborn dude, wasn't he? I mean, there he is laying, taken for dead. He gets up, brushes himself off, much to the shock of everybody around. And what does he say? What's next? What's next? You know, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we know we're going to have trouble. And the Holy Spirit calls us to say, yes, I will lead you. I will guide you. But just say yes. And then whatever happens, ask What's next? We know God is leading us. We know God is, is directing us. What's next? And you know, not all of us are called to be the Apostle Paul. He was a unique character. He, his job was to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. He reached the world in his lifetime. But we, we, we have things that God calls us to. Maybe it's where you, where you go to school. God's called you somehow to reach your school. Or maybe it's your neighborhood. Or maybe it's, it's something that someone else has started. And you can get on board by praying or working or, or by giving uh, to it. But God has called all of us. And some of us may say, well, I'm too old. And that's possible. It's too old. You're, you're, you're too old for something. But none of us are too old for something. You might be too old for something, but, you, but none of us are too old for something. That makes sense, believe it or not. Continue to tag along, along uh, with Paul as he goes on his second missionary journey. On his second missionary journey, it, it describes it in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, Now when they had gone to Perga and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit. And so the, here, here's another principle. Follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Say, God, uh, God, if you don't want me to do this, let me know. Somehow let me know because I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say what next until you say don't do this. I want your guidance. I want your direction. And so listen for the Holy Spirit. Two times uh, uh, Paul had a, had a plan of going somewhere. Because he was the mission to the Gent his mission was to the Gentiles around the world. He wanted to go to reach Asia, but the Holy Spirit said no. You see, God has a big plan, and we need to do our part to follow it because we don't know where ultimately it's going to lead. And so then what happened? So passing by uh, Mysia, he came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he'd seen the vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Look for signs from God. Look for open doors. Expect God to lead you to close some doors and to open other doors. You're going to have trouble in this life. And yet, at the same time, be willing to say yes. Be willing to say, what's next? And listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you go on to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 17, you see uh, Paul going to Philippi. It was a, a large city, and he began to preach the gospel there, and he found a, a group of women that were interested in hearing the gospel. One particular lady, her name was Lydia. She was a seller of purple. She invited Paul to come into her house and to stay there and use that as the base for sharing the gospel. And so sometimes God calls us, if we're followers of him, to do something for someone else to help the ministry continue on. What is God calling you to do? Be willing to say yes, but expect trouble. And so, so Paul was, uh, was staying in the house there, and he was going out and preaching the gospel, and this young girl, a young slave girl, was following him wherever he went, and she was, uh, she, every time he would start a sentence, she would yell out this, These men are servants of the Most High God, 
and proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, that doesn't seem like a bad message, right? But how would you like every time you were, you were trying to speak, someone to just yell that out? It was a distraction. It was something. And she, she was, uh, was uh, demon-possessed. And, and actually, some of the, the people from the town, some of the merchants were making money on her because they would, people would pay to have their fortunes told. And so Paul stopped. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. He, he threw this demon out of her, and she became a follower of Christ herself, which made, every, uh, made these, uh, these merchants mad because they lost this, this source of revenue. And so ultimately, uh, they had him uh, 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 beaten. Here's what it says in, in verse 22. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid... Many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. And so here, they're now beaten again. They're, they're put, in, put in prison. I don't know about you, but at this point, I would say, you know what? You know what? I've been saying yes, and I know there's trouble, but I think maybe God's leading me to say, let's go back home and find some friendly faces. But not Paul, not, not at this time. And God worked a miracle and he was, he was let out of prison. And here's what happened next. It says, and when, and when it was day, the magistrates sent the officer saying, let, the, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison and now do they put us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told the words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans and they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart their city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia and when they had seen their brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Here's the thing I want you to say, what, what's interesting to note is that Paul used the, the legal system in order to further the, the cause of Christ. Now, one thing that I think is disturbing a lot of us these days is the fact that, that coming to church, gathering together, has been outlawed. And we understand there's this virus that people are concerned about, but we also have the scripture which tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It tells us that we're supposed to get together to give. We're supposed to get together to take communion. We're supposed to get together to pray. That we get together to be close to each other and to have fellowship. And yet the law tells us, the, the, the government is telling us not to get together to do the, these things. And so I understand I understand that, that we need to consider the safety of, uh, of the people that, that attend our church and the people that are coming in on the one hand. But on the other hand, I know that God has called us to do certain things. And, and, and we have laws in our, our country. And those laws say that, that you, you, uh, you can't uh, prohibit people from, get, uh, from coming together to worship. And yet that's what's happening. And so, yes, we can put up with this for a while because we're, we're trying to be considerate, we're trying to be law-abiding, but at the same time, we need, to, we need to realize that we as Christians have rights. And just like Paul asserted his rights there as a Roman citizen, there may come the day, and it may not be very many weeks from now, we're going to have to say, you know what? The law may be that way, but we have to listen to God rather than man. And so I understand it's a fine balance. But at some point, we need to realize that we need to follow God. And that doesn't mean every, this is because the church door is open, that everybody has to come. Of course, if you're, if, if, if you're not um, uh, feeling well or if, you're, if you are uh, afraid that you might contract uh, the virus, there's nothing that mandates that you come, but there is a mandate from the Word of God that we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're going to talk about... Thessalonica. We said we're starting a series in the book of 1 Thessalonians to the Thessalonians. And step by step by step, we have seen how God led Paul. Paul realizing that there was going to be trouble. Paul realizing that it wasn't going to be easy, but that he was going to follow the Spirit and always ask, what's next? And believe God to, to lead him. And ultimately, he comes to Thessalonica. And when he's there for three consecutive uh, 
Saturdays, he goes to the synagogue and he preaches the gospel, the good news of Christ in this massive city of over 200,000 people. And it said not many Jews believed, but a, a multitude of Greeks believed and some devout uh, leading women trusted Christ. And so Paul had a nucleus in only three weeks of staying in this city. But of course, what happened? Satan was not, allow, uh, was not about to let this city turn to Christ. It says, but the Jews were not persuaded in, in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 5, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out, of, out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. There's the money phrase right there. He, he's, pointing, he's talking about Paul and Paul's team. And he says, these who have turned the world upside down. Yes, Paul was, was experiencing two steps forward and one step back on all through these journeys. But ultimately, God has a big plan for you, for us today, just like he had for Paul. The idea is to turn the world right side up because it's upside down wherever you look. And God wants to use you. You don't know what part your plan is. You may not know how, how it fits in the big scheme of things, but God has a plan for you. Each of us need to recognize it's not going to be easy. We're in a battle, but each day in the battle, we need to ask God, what do you want me to do? How can I share in this battle? How can I be a part of the battle that's going on for your kingdom? I want the Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me, to direct me. And I always want to look to you to ask, what's next and how can I be a part of it? And that leads us to finally to 1 Thessalonians. We said we're going to have a, a series on 1 Thessalonians. We're going, only going to hit a couple of verses in uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses um, 6 through 8. I want you to listen carefully about what Paul described uh, these new believers and this church in Thessalonica. And it says, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord when you received the message with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, despite great affliction. Again, for the, for the people in Thessalonica, those that believed, he said, you believed, you put your trust in Christ, you received a forgiveness for your sins. But yes, along with becoming a believer, there is trouble. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For from, the mess, for from you, the message of the Lord has echoed forth, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place reports of your faith in God have spread, so that we do not need to say anything. Paul said, look, I can now, I can get a picture of what God's doing, a much bigger picture. I was just doing my part, but all of a sudden I realized, you people in, in Thessalonica, you spread the word to the, to the cities around you, to the regions around you, and ultimately it went to the ends of the earth because I kept going, because God said, I want to use you, and so I kept taking one step at a time, and ultimately now I can see it was part of God's big plan. This is the message for us today as we start to look uh, at, at, that, at, at that document called the uh, First Thessalonians that tells basically the basics of what it means to be a follower of Christ. We see that we need to realize it's not going to be easy, but the Holy Spirit is going to be with us. The Holy Spirit is going to guide us. The Holy Spirit is going to sustain us. And we can always ask what's next and take the next step. And so I, I'm inviting you for the next few weeks to join me as we take the next steps in basic training, basic training for new believers found in the book of First Thessalonians. Close in prayer. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Have a good week.